nationalisme, c'est la guerre. You never get a second chance for a first impression. That's the expression. Good evening. Um, my name is Helle Huck. I'm your moderator for this evening. Um, I'm a financial economic reporter for uh, the Financiële Dagblad. Um, are there a lot of people from abroad here or mainly Dutch? Who's from abroad? Yes. I'll just go to you. Where are you from? India. India. Welcome. And you thought, okay, can I spend my euro still here in this week? Or why are you coming to this event? Uh, I was taking refuge from the rain. <laughs> you will have a, a very exciting evening. Very warm welcome, all the way from India. Um, the future of the Eurozone. Um, you just saw a small movie, but let, let me give a little bit of, of context what this is all about this evening. Because this program is part of the second edition of the Forum on European Culture. And this year's theme, as you saw in the little movie, is Act for Democracy. So it's four days. It's not only here in the Bali, but also in, at other venues. Uh, artists, thinkers, journalists, politicians from all over the world have gathered here in Amsterdam to discuss Europe's challenges and think about Europe's future. So the Forum is an initiative of the Bali and Dutch culture. So then you have some context. Who had this, uh, oh, here we go again, feeling when you read about Italy and the elections? And did you think that we will, who thinks we will have a new Euro crisis or not? Because I thought this is 2009 all over again. If you hear all those words about uh, Italy, Germany, 10 year spread, you know, we always talk about spreads and debt ceilings and whatever it takes and stuff like that. Um, and the funny thing is, or I don't know if it's really funny, but the, 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 the Nordic countries and Germany and the Netherlands, okay, the economy is doing fine and we think we have managed the crisis and everything is okay. Um, but we still have a lot of problems. When we founded the Eurozone, we thought we would converge, you know, that everybody would be wealthy and everybody would be fine and there would be no unemployment. Or we'll go to Greece, go to Spain, go to Italy. It's definitely not that, that, that good. So we, we are diverging. And is that because of the euro? Is that because of bad government? Is it a combination? That's also still possible. I don't think we can blame the euro for everything, but it's definitely true that the European project is not finished yet. We're not there yet. So we're going to talk about that this evening. And we have three speakers. Uh, who I would like to uh, shortly introduce. We'll start with Federico Fubini from Italy. So all your questions on Italy, we will do that in the first 15 minutes. All your, no, not all your questions. We'll take uh, three to five questions. Um, we're very happy that he's here, Branko Milosevic, who is, um, I think everybody who reads something about inequality will know that he is one of the main academics writing about that. And from the Netherlands, we have Sandra Flippen, who is an associate professor at the Erasmus uh, University in Rotterdam. And today, the 1st of June, she has started as an economist for ABN AMRO. But it's her day off, so I'm very happy she can be here. She will start on Monday. Uh, welcome for everybody. Uh, so I would like first to introduce uh, Federico Fabini. He is a journalist and economist. He works for Corriere della Sera, and um, the stage is for you. Welcome. Would you like to have this microphone? All questions uh, on Italy, please, to Branko Milan, uh, Milanovic. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. um, okay, I was told uh, that's the first time in my life that instead of writing a story for other people to read, 
it's uh, the fair punishment for me to, to write the story, for me to read out. So um, uh, Dante would have uh, uh, probably said that as one of the punishment in hell. Uh, write a story and then read it as well. Um, uh, I had planned for an easy trip to beautiful Amsterdam, coming here to exchange thoughts on how to make the Eurozone, as they say, resilient to the next shock. But this time I can't, for that shock is now. I come from a country that is experiencing, experiencing a populist takeover, and while this is not unprecedented in the G7 or the EU, think Hungary, Poland, Greece, Brexit or Trump, every time such moments come, we all have the same questions. We want to know whether the consequences will be traumatic or there is a route back to normalcy. In the case of Italy, it's too soon to tell. Anyway, I don't know. But I can try to sum up some reasons that got us here in the first place and the lessons that they hold for the country, for the Eurozone, and the way we, as Europeans, collectively fail to contain the populist tide. I, stre I, st I stress these points because I suspect that the sort of reform that would truly make the Eurozone more resilient today is not so much some new financial arrangements, key as they might be. Rather, the kind of change we should seek is very political in nature. EU countries need to learn how to cooperate in the face of jingoism, just as they uh, have uh, learned to cooperate against protectionism after the Great Depression. So far, they have not learned that lesson. Their attitude, our attitudes as European to populism, has been similar to the one governments held to trade and protectionism in the 1930s, each trying to shift the problem onto their neighbor until it catches them back with a vengeance. I would call this attitude the beggar thy neighbor approach to populism that is prevailing in Europe today. And I will try to explain in a short while what I mean by that. Let me stress, before I do that, that the root causes of the current shift in Italy are first and foremost domestic. And they go back in time. For too long, governments have let their people down. Italians have already experienced two lost decades as current GDP per capita was first reached more than 20 years ago. This is not just the crisis of one generation. Productivity in the service sector, the one least exposed to competition, has stagnated or even slightly fallen at least since the 1990s. Those ills are of Italy's own making, with deep roots. After 1945, Italy changed its political institutions far more than it reformed its economic ones. We moved from dictatorship, Mussolini, to democracy. But the trappings of the fascist system lived on in key areas of business life. Corporatist, a corporatist approach to market regulation, wide, widespread government meddling in finance and industry. Of course, those, uh, some of those features have worn out over time, thanks to the Maastricht tr Treaty and globalization in general, but others have lived on, lived on to this day. Wage bargaining, for instance, in Italy is still mostly centralized. The legacy of, of the then corporatist system, despite the huge productivity differences across firms and regions. One figure makes that clear. Average compensation per employee in the private sector is just 6% lower in the south than in the north. And yet, the productivity gap is a multiple of that. Investing south of Rome, therefore, becomes a heroic task, which explains why that area comprising 20 million people 
has ended up losing over 30% in GDP per capita to the Eurozone average since 2001. I can give you the figure 40% to Spain, even 5% to Greece. The Mezzogiorno's experience in the single currency is a disaster comparable to Greece. Even as Italy as a whole has recently overtaken France in extra EU export sales. Little surprise that 47%, 47%, half of the population of Southerners have voted for the Five Stars movement, promising them a universal subsidy. You can see here a straight line from fascist era corporatism to today's populist tide. This kind of obsolete economic structure is just not compatible with a monetary union, but is hard to change as it reflects real interests. Indeed, several governments tried and failed to modernize the country or did not go far enough. Silvio Berlusconi needs no introduction. Mario Monti, as a technocratic prime minister, took some action, but stalled as soon, the, as soon as the idea dawned on him to compete in elections that he would badly lose. Matteo Henzi took some steps as well, but then fell prey to his own outsized ego. This is not the whole story, however, as Europe has unwittingly added to Italy's populist wave too. First, fiscal conservatism in recession and the ECB's reluctance to play its role until July 2012 led to excess austerity. That in turn wreaked havoc on uh, the Italian middle class and its politics. On the day Mario Monti took office in 2011, the Five Stars and the League were polling below 10% combined, the two of them together. They are now above 50%. Second, Italy resorted to a fraction of the amount of state aid as a share of GDP that many other advanced economies spent to bail out banks. But this was met in Europe with a stark narrative of guilt and the abrupt way uh, bank bail-in was enforced on small savers in 2015 boosted the five stars at a time when their fortunes were flagging. Finally, Italians' perception that the EU was letting them down in the migrant crisis helped the far right big time. I stress these points not in order to portray my country as a victim. As I said, we are victims first and foremost of ourselves, but to show how the beggar thy neighbor approach to populism is proving toxic in Europe. In each country, traditional politicians try to ensure themselves against their own domestic populist threat, but they do so in a way that stocks populism in neighboring countries. Often, they just try to survive by accepting the agenda set by their own domestic populist competitors. The result is a domino of political spillovers, which represents, to me, the biggest threat to the future of the Euro and the EU as a whole. Let me give you a few examples of how that works. In 2015, Renzi was able to get budget flexibility, quote unquote, from the EU Commission by claiming that he needed more deficit spending in order to keep the five stars at bay. Soon, that enraged the German public for the alleged break of the rules, fueling far-right IFD propaganda against Chancellor Merkel. On the other hand, the very same German popular, uh, popular anger had previously led the Berlin government to impose too much rigor on Greece, inflaming a scary populist revolt in Athens in 2015. On banks, the story is somewhat similar. Populist parties in the Netherlands and Germany feasted on taxpayers' understandable anger at bailouts. 
something that led governments to support strict anti-bailout legislation in the EU. But as I said, the effect on Italy was the opposite. The new European law prolonged the credit crunch, while b bank bail-in on small savers fed populist protests. Migration is another case in point. Italy first reacted to the wave of refugees by waving them through the Alps, in essence outsourcing the problem to France and Austria. That boosted the FPE ultra-nationalists in Vienna and Marine Le Pen in Paris, of course. But when Austria and France reacted by sealing their own borders to Italy, it was the League's turn to benefit from the resulting popular frustration in Italy. Beggar thy neighbor caught us back in full. Traditional politicians refused to cooperate against populism as they did uh, against protectionism, well, until recently, because they are usually dominated by concerns about their own careers after the next elections. They are potential unemployed. It eludes them that in a matter of months or a few years, they will be badly impacted by the very problems that they have uh, tried to export onto others. Beggar thy neighbor will always come back to haunt them. Greece in 2015 was a threat to all. Italy could be as well. It is not too late for countries to learn to cooperate, although I doubt they will anytime soon. Beggar thy neighbor still uh, rules until damage, like was the case on protectionism in the 1930s, proves too much for all. Like, okay, they were, were elected, it was democratic elections, and now they will, um, I will give you the microphone, and let them do the job. I mean, we'll see how it goes. I think, I think it's um, when, when uh, political parties win elections, it's only fair and even good news that they uh, come to government and they uh, show everybody what they can do. Uh, it would have been a mistake and, and also uh, dangerous uh, to prevent these parties from uh, running the country. That would have only increased the populist fever because there would have been anger at um, <clears throat> a democratic process that didn't quite work out. Um, I would say something that I have not written and I think uh, will be part of our discussion. Um, the way of course, uh, European governments have not learned to cooperate against populists. They have been trying. The, the only image I have in my mind, you can imagine a carpet with a bubble of air, and that bubble of air is populism. And you can try to squeeze it, and it will move on another side of the carpet. And that carpet is Europe. Everybody is trying to squeeze it, to move it to another part. And that, of course, does, cannot work. You still have that bubble, and probably the bubble could increase. So the way to cooperate, to me, uh, if, if we think about Europe, you, you, you mentioned that word, convergence. Europe was all about convergence, but convergence between countries, at most between regions. Think about mm -hmm. the EU funds for the poorest regions. We never discussed, oh, sorry, that's the bubble. <laughs> Population is getting Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we never discussed convergence within country, countries, social convergence within countries. We should really not only tackle inequality within countries, but inequality of opportunity. The sense that too many people have that there aren't opportunities for them. And uh, essentially, the EU has outsourced this kind of stuff to mm -hmm. domestic policies in different countries. But then it, it, it comes back in terms of the political consequences of inequality. So probably it, it's high time for the EU 
to decide that inequality per se, not just so social convergence within societies, within the same group of voters, is, should be an objective for the EU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rather, I would say, we have seen policies that yes, I have uh, worked in, in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand, yes. Any questions from the audience? Yes? Could you, uh, my name is Bram Srimponorov, could you uh, comment on um, a statistic that is very often quoted that the national debt in Italy is mostly domestically held, whereas in Greece, and particularly in Greece, it was internationally held by the international publicly held banks in France and Germany, and that that makes, it makes a huge political difference? Um, uh, okay, uh, I, I will, I will, uh, I will comment because the statistics uh, 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 is there. So I will, I will make. Uh, you can think about a country as a balance sheet. Okay, you, th you think about a country as a balance sheet, where you have different parts of the balance sheet. One, one part is the public sector, another part is the private sector. But then the, you can split the private sector in two. So one is households and, and non-financial companies. Just think on, on those terms. Italy is highly unequal. What do I mean by that? Is that you have uh, incredibly rich households in terms of uh, a multiple of disposable income. It reached nine times disposable income. Now it's not nine times, but it's really very high in international comparison. Germany, I think, I'm speaking under control of serious economists, is about six. Uh, and uh, Anglo-Saxon countries is four to five. Um, and then you have on the other side of, of, of that balance sheet, the public debt, which means that the distribution of wealth has been completely uh, distorted by social preferences and distrust, mistrust, misbehavior, tax evasion, what have you. So households have kept all the wealth to themselves and even have cashed in from interests, from essentially uh, uh, interest from, from uh, sovereign bonds. And so we, they have created a, a, a poor state, well, a rich country with a poor state, uh, a very, well, very wealthy families with a bankrupt uh, government side, which is completely unequal. It, it, it is a kind of inequality that Italy should address. I would say, I would respond in this way. But uh, if, the, if the implication is that Italy can default and nothing will happen, I would doubt it. I would doubt it. For, I, I'll give you just one figure. The exposure of the, just the French banking system on Italy uh, is $270 billion. It's expressed in dollars because uh, the BIS figures are in dollars, which is comparable to the exposure of, of the whole uh, banking system, French banking system on Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Ireland uh, right before the 2010 crisis. So they cannot really afford that. Okay, thank you very much. Sandra, you have one question? Thank you. I was wondering, so um, you said that immigration, arrival of immigrants, uh, produces success for populist parties. Um, I was wondering how you then explain uh, various studies that are showing that regions in Europe with a higher rate of immigrants um, show less populistic votes. So basically what I'm saying that that populism uh, comes from countries, while uh, regions where people have actually experienced interaction with immigrants seem to be less populistic. That seems to be contrary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, when we talk about, because it's a uh, very pointed one, I think when we talk about immigration, we have to know exactly what, what we are talking about. Uh, I'll give you one shocking figure that would shock nobody here but uh, 60 million Italians. Net migration into Italy is zero. Zero. So the number of uh, foreigners, uh, the change, the variation in the number of foreigners of the last two, three years is nearly zero. Because just a few people arrive with the boats from the, in the, you know, from central Mediterranean. Many Polish go back or go to Germany. 
So um, I'll come to, to your uh, reference. If you look at migration by quality, quote unquote quality, so the uh, education, the formal education of migrants, you see a striking uh, correspondence between the average in that territory and or in terms of education and the education of migrants. Give you an example, Berlin, about 30% of the natives have a university degree, tertiary education, about 30% of the foreigners have ter tertiary education. Sicily, 11% of the natives have a tertiary education, same 10% of the foreigners. Uh, I think that there is a um, German demographer that has done that, and it shows a nearly perfect correspondence, which means that in economic terms, each area tends to attract the level of talent it needs and the level of sophistication. So the kind of the ability to integrate it depends very much on the level of sophistication of your economy. So if you if you want to uh, have migrants that are easier to integrate, that bring more value added and so on and so forth, what you need to do is to have a good economy, educated people, good companies, uh, high value added companies and so on and so forth. So definitely yes. So that probably explains your remark. What happened in Italy is slightly different because here we are talking, the, the migration people react to today and it's been, uh, look, the first time in uh, 25 years that we have zero migration net in terms of uh, variation from uh, year to year, you know, year X, year X plus one. Because for 25 years, migration was very strong. And we did not get this kind of reaction. Even illegal migration was strong. What we have now is on TV, you see those huge boats full of uh, people coming from Africa, and you don't know whether they have diseases, you don't know where they are from. And all these people apply for asylum. About 50% of the applications are rejected. But when the application is rejected, the people, well, essentially, we were talking about, the, er, about this earlier, they are handed a piece of paper where it's written, you, you have to leave the country in 15 days. They never do, because uh, they, they have no means to leave the country. Uh, their, their own country of origin very often does not recognize them as nationals. They have no documents, and they have no will and they have no documents. So they, they cannot work in the legal economy either. So uh, Italian cities have, uh, you know, all these people have sprung up in front of supermarkets, essentially begging. Some of them, of course, when, the, when, when uh, migrants are not integrated, they tend to commit crime more often. This is statistically demonstrated. Uh, and these are the people uh, Italians are reacting to. And I think this will be one of the litmus tests of the new government, because in their program is we take those 600,000 people, so 1% of resident population, and we lift them back to their countries, except what are their countries, we don't know, except we don't have readmission agreements. So what does the new government think to do? Probably, leave, no do some uh, parachuting over Africa of these people. It's not very realistic. And this is the part that concerns me, and I'll stop here. They talk about residency centers for 600,000 people. So we become a camp for forced residents of refugee, of all would-be refugees. And the part that concerns me the most, having talked to uh, EU officials, is that the way they think to make peace with the league, with the far right in Italy, is to finance those camps. Uh, because this is what happened with Greece in the end. It's forced residence. And uh, sorry, but this is already what is happening in, Bavar in Bavaria today. They are forced to stay in the camps. And uh, so 
this is the part that concerns me the most. And if Italy, there is no reason, financial reason or economic, economic reason why Italy should get into a financial crisis. But with the wrong policies, we can. If we get into a financial crisis and we need help, the peace will be reached. And I think, uh, I'm sorry, I should not be so uh, nasty to our German friends, but I think in the German governments, the idea of making Italy the buffer state for these kind of people who are rejected uh, asylum is very much there. Okay. Federico, thank you for now. We'll see you later on. Um, yeah, just put it on there. Yeah, thank you. Um, our next speaker uh, worked for the World Bank for many years. He's a Serbian American economist, uh, Branko Milanovic, did a lot of research on inequality. Actually, I'll show your book. I mean, in the end, even academics just have to sell their books. So, Global Inequality, one of his latest books. Um, so he will be uh, our next speaker, Branko. Does it? Yes, it's translated in Dutch. You can go Why did you give me the English mind. version then? Well, because I couldn't read the Dutch one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope uh, the, the mic, does the mic work? Uh, after this uh, very optimistic presentation that Federico gave, I was actually thinking that my presentation originally would be a little bit bleak, but uh, uh, I really cannot match the, the bleakness with which the previous one ended. Uh, I will be speaking, of course, as you know, actually I work with global inequality. Uh, Europe obviously plays a big role because it is, as you look at the European Union, it is of course the largest uh, economic bloc in the world, has more than half a billion people. Uh, these are of course rich people. And there are many of course interesting issues from the economic, from the economics of inequality. I might even say something later about the convergence because it's really a very interesting issue, not only within nation states, as Federico was speaking of Mezzogiorno, which of course has been an issue for since the unification of Italy, actually, but also, um, uh, also between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and nowadays also between the Southern Europe and Northern Europe. There are many, I think, interesting aspects there, including lack of convergence for many for, and convergence of other uh, East European countries. But, you know, it's a very mixed, mixed picture. And just to do one more uh, sort of only reference to Federico was saying is if you look at actual numbers and do the rich countries only, let's take the club of OECD countries before the new members from the uh, Latin America and Eastern Europe came, and do the simple calculation of convergence between those members. You know, the convergence actually ended around 1980s. That's actually very interesting is that you have very strong convergence from 1945 to, uh, to the early 1980s, and afterwards you don't have it. Um, so something happened, and um, we don't have, even within the club of the Western economies, that convergence has stopped. Now, I'm going to make three points, and I would uh, be kept on, on leash, to, not to speak too long. But uh, uh, the first, and actually I wrote about them on my blog, so you can actually also, if you fail to sort of listen, maybe fall asleep, you can go and read my blog tonight. Uh, the first one is a, is a kind of an observation. I would actually say that this is a little bit of a European paradox. When you actually travel, especially in Western Europe, but also the Southern Europe, and even Eastern Europe, you are actually struck that it is absolutely the best continent that actually people live. And this is also true in the vein of Max Rosen's work and uh, uh, that if you look at any objective indicator of Europe, it is actually better than practically anywhere else in the world. It, although the income level of West European countries are still is below the American level, there are many other advantages, you know, including the fact that, of course, as Federico was saying, like the wealth to income ratio in Europe is higher. The reason is that Europe has been acquiring wealth, and Italy is actually a perfect example of that, acquiring wealth for a very, very long period 
period of time. I'm not talking about only the arts and museums. I'm actually talking about other like wealth, which is very marketable, although art is also marketable. But Italy is kind of an outlier because for its income level, it has too much wealth, in other words. And this is the opposite of countries like China, which for its own income level has too little wealth because it is a country that started acquiring wealth only recently. So in that sense, Europe is, of course, a, a very beautiful continent, a rich continent with extremely good social indicators, with a large welfare state, with lots of art, culture, perfect infrastructure. So you would actually say, what is better than that? However, and that's a little bit of a paradox, it's a continent where there's a large amount of dissatisfaction with the political system, with, uh, the, uh, with the levels of unemployment, with uh, precarious jobs. So really there is a little bit of a disconnect between the objective indicators which are very good, particularly in a global context, and the subjective feeling of people. Recently, I was actually in Paris, and one evening, I forgot actually that it was the 50th anniversary of the, of the Les Evenements, as they are called. And so they were, as you know, French published enormous amount of statistics. And then I just did a compilation from like two, uh, you know, uh, newspapers. And, you know, 50 years were phenomenal, actually, by all indicators. There have never been 50 years in history of France that were so good. You know, in, on income level, the size of apartment that people live in, um, the number of uh, goods, like, for example, car. How many uh, salaries do you need to pay for a uh, car? The quality of cars, the quality of life, uh, life expectancy. Every indicator that you can imagine went up. What indicator did not go up is youth unemployment. And actually, oh, and did go up. Actually, became worse. It was five percent, and it's now I think sixteen or seventeen percent. So there are some indicators, but important indicators. And I think it's also reflected in lack of opportunities among young people, uh, gig economy, precariousness, the change which we see. For example, I work with Luxembourg Income Study, and you see this. Uh, the, the Guardian did a study based on on our data. You see that actually many of the people of the younger generation have nowadays lower incomes than their parents had in their age. You know, it's not only that they don't expect to do as well as the parents did, it's that actually uh, 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 empirically, they are now, when they are 30, they have lower incomes than their parents had when they were 30. So this is this malaise that I spoke about. Uh, but now let me go on two points, which are long-term points, and which would, of course, relate also to what was said before, uh, which are somewhat pessimistic. Uh, what I called this, actually I called it Europe's curse of wealth. It's, uh, 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 it was translated, it's basically malédiction, of, malédiction de richesse, if you prefer it. Now, what are these two malédictions? Uh, the first one is the very fact that Europe is rich, as I was saying now. It means that from the point of view of migrants, and it, the fact that it has large welfare state, is a perfect place to come. It's very simple that actually anybody who just looks at the map and knows the numbers should come to Europe. And people do. And not only do they do, because the gaps between European and Sub-Saharan incomes are now currently 11 to 1. If you just take all of the Western Europe, put an average number of its income, and you take Sub-Saharan Africa, the ratio is 11 to 1. But that ratio has increased. It used to be 7 to 1. Then it used to be 8 to 1. And it, has went, it went up and up. Africa, as we know, is not converging. There are some individual cases, but relatively few. If you take all of Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, it is not converging. And moreover, it is a continent that in the next 50 years, or maybe even a century, is the continent with the largest increase in population. So nowadays, if you take Sub-Saharan Africa and compare with the European Union, Sub-Saharan Africa has about twice as many people in Europe. In 30 years or 40 years, it's going to have four times as many people in, as Europe. So it, is, it does not take a sort of a genius to understand the problem of migration, which is driven by two things, by wealth of Europe, and hence the, the title of my blog, which is The Curse of Wealth, wealth of Europe and poverty of Africa and large discrepancy in population growth and actual populations is only going to get worse. So after what Federico was saying about Europe creating de facto 
I am not using it in a pejorative sense, but concentration camps, like they were originally used just to put people together. Uh, what will happen when you actually have a much bigger inflow of people than today? So this is a, a, a very sort of, I think, uh, sobering thought. You just, as I said before, one has simply to look at numbers. And I have to say a few political things there, because it is quite extraordinary the level of, um, I would say, responsibility or inability to look at the future that Europe, individual countries in different cases, contributed really to a destruction of the Middle East. One, in one case, was Iraq, then in the other case was Libya, then now Obviously, nobody can do anything about the Syrian civil war, but essentially that region has entirely been, entirely been destroyed, and it's not obviously uh, I mean, uh, surprising that people from there would come. Which actually then leads to the, to, 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 to the realization that the problem of migration that Europe has to deal with, deal with is a secular issue. It is an issue that is not going to be solved from one summer to another. It's an issue for which one has to be prepared for another 100 years. So I, maybe it sounds too exaggerated, but I honestly don't think that actually that issue is going to go away for a number of decades, simply because the gaps of income are so high, knowledge of these gaps is why spread, ability to move is much greater than it used to be in the past, and you cannot really put, as they say, toothpaste back into the tube simply because it has gone out once. You cannot close the border. You cannot let people not know that you're much richer. You cannot create sort of uh, 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 fences and walls in the countries themselves. So this is, I think, as I said, it is a big problem. It might require actually an entirely new uh, deal between Europe and the European Union and the African Union. I actually write about that in my book in, the Glob in Global Inequality. I will not go here into my proposals, but I think they need to be multilateral and they need to be quota-based and they need to include a compulsory return of the migrants who come here and work. And they need also, the, the last point, they need to actually uh, 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 stop considering citizenship as a binary category, either you are in or out, but I, you, you have to have, I, I believe, much more graduated citizenships where if you will not have access to many of the rights that citizens do have. So I think it is a, a small, I mean, it is one of the proposals, but I think one has to think about that quite seriously. Now, the second, uh, the second issue, uh, which is also curse of wealth, is the following one. As we have seen, actually, the countries, has become, they become richer. They don't only become wealthier, but they become wealthier more than in proportion to their wealth, uh, their income. In other words, what I want to say, when the country goes from $10,000 per capita to $20,000 per capita, its wealth normally does not increase twice. It increases more than twice because you have saving and accumulation. It's very common also in individuals that actually you become, your wealth to income ratio becomes higher the higher your income. So a person who is paid, you know, half a million dollars as a CEO is probably not having the ratio of wealth that somebody who is paid 20,000 has. He has. He has much higher, or she has much higher wealth to income ratio, which means his wealth is a greater multiple of income. Now, what is the implication for that for, for the rich countries like, like Europe? The implication of that is that wealth as a, as a, uh, uh, as a ratio to income will go up, and then uh, income from that wealth is going to go up in GDP or in your national income. That's something that actually Piketty spent quite a lot of attention on. So the only way that that would not go up is if you have a decline in the rate of return that that wealth gives you. But that rate of return has not gone down. So essentially we have the rising share of income from property, which is observable for the last 30 years in most rich countries. Now what is the problem there? The problem there is that it, because wealth is so uh, heavily concentrated, any increase in the share of income from capital or from property in GDP almost automatically translates in the rising interpersonal inequality. 
So the problem is not per se that rich countries will have to have more of their income from wealth. In actually, in some sense, it's very good because you need to work less and let your wealth work for you. The problem is that that wealth is very heavily concentrated in the hands of the few. So as the share of wealth goes up, then inequality of income goes up. So this is the second uh, sort of malédiction de la richesse, where actually you have uh, an inbuilt in increase in inequality, which happens simply through the process of accumulation and countries becoming wealthier which then in requires also a policy, like migration requires a policy, so this requires a policy. Uh, Piketty's suggestion or, or a recommendation was taxation, worldwide taxation of wealth. Another possibility is higher uh, inheritance taxes. Another possibility is working on deconcentration, I know it's a big word, but deconcentration of uh, uh, of wealth, in other words, of making the distribution of wealth be more equal. Just to give you an idea, and I don't have the slides here with me, but trust me, it does exist. Uh, when you look at the Gini coefficient of income from property, which includes, of course, in, in profits, interest, dividends, and all of that, the Gini coefficient in all rich countries is about 0.9. The 0.9 is a coefficient that actually you get when about you know 10% of people own between 80 and 90% of the assets, financial assets of the country, and that's the case in the Netherlands. It's the case in, in Sweden. Sweden actually has higher concentration of wealth. It's the case in the U.S. or U.K. and anywhere else. So essentially, this is the second issue that we have to deal with, and that is the issue that with the continuation of the current policies that don't address that you will have automatic increase in inequality, which then, of course, would make all these political issues even deeper. So in conclusion, essentially, the political issues that we face today are largely the result, of course, of the things that we see on the ground, and that's migration, and that's rising inequality. And what my point was is that actually to see them in a in a context, first global and over time, and not to have illusions that these two issues are going to disappear by themselves, but that they really require very tough policies in some cases to take care of. So thank you very much. I'm sure you would um, sort of find this very sort of reassuring about the future. <laughs> thank you. Actually, you were too short. You had a few more minutes left, uh, Branko. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. You, you spoke so fast. You you spoke faster than Lucky Luke can shoot. Um, um, so, does anybody have a question for for Branko? Now you have one. I want to feel, would like to look at the audience first. It, or was it? It was a lot of information, wasn't it? There's a lot to digest. Yes, what's your question? Yeah. Well, maybe one question um, is, you explained uh, why uh, the issues, the realities around migration need new policies. And then you went on to say, well, inequality is rising due to a number of mechanisms in, in, in built in, in the, the current system. And therefore, we need policies on that. But what exactly I think you didn't really address that. What exactly is the problem with inequality? You mean, uh, why should we reduce inequality or how we should reduce it? No, why? why? Oh, why we should reduce? I think, of course, inequality, uh, well, let me put it like that. I think there are at least two negative effects of inequality. Uh, I think the first one is uh, intergenerational transmission of inequality in the sense that people who come from poorer families uh, have no uh, op opportunities and possibility to actually accede to the normal type of jobs that they would have had if they were not from such families. In other words, that inequality cements that type of inequality over generations. And you know, this is not good, as, as we know, because essentially it is a little bit, I always give this as an example, is when people go after countries that discriminate against women, one of the arguments that they give them, they say, look, you've got 50% of your population. You say, well, we don't really care about their talents. We'll just 
have our economy run with 50% of people. The same thing happens when you have inbuilt inequality across generations. People who are born in wrong families and without inheritance, without all the connections that you get from family, education, and so on, they are basically excluded. So that's bad for the growth of the economy. So that would be one argument. And the second argument, we, I think both of them are quite strong, so maybe there are subsidiary arguments that I will not address. The second argument is a political argument, as we have seen, is that the rich more and more are able to essentially buy the political process, to implement legislation which they like, and then to further reinforce that power. So we have really a sort of, uh, um, and not there, you need almost a sort of, uh, 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 you know, to sort of cut this knot, uh, is that you have the, the inequality which becomes transmitted across generations and it's reinforced by, I have to say, two more phenomena which are actually not that well known yet. Uh, the first phenomenon is that you have more and more people who are both capital and labor rich. So that you have an uh, 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 increasing share of people who are in the top decile by labor income and by capital income. Now that makes it also more difficult to deal with them because they are actually meritocratically earning some part. And then you have so-called assortative mating where people of course similar education and income levels marry. No, this is something obviously the state cannot rule that poor men should marry rich women and vice versa. But it is also something which makes inequality higher and then it's being reinforced through the political process. So let me just summarize, there are two points. One of them is intergenerational transmission of inequality. The second one is the lock on the political process. It was a long re reply, but you asked me a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sandra, can I invite you uh, to the stage as well? Sandra Flippen. Um, okay, well, the gentleman already talked a lot. Um, let's look at the... D you're all invited, if you want to ask something, in, and you do that in a polite manner, you are very much invited, you know, just to jump in, because we're here for you. So just raise your hand, and I will get a microphone and, 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 and get to you. So please do if you have a, if a, if you have a question. Sandra, um, just to look at the Netherlands. Yes. Uh, how um, unequal are we? Well, actually, um, if we look at the uh, today, actually there was a report on um, on inequality in the Netherlands and the, with the new statistics, and also in relation to the effect that globalization in the last, uh, or like at least since 1990, uh, the effect that that had on the um, unequal spreading of the benefits of globalization, and um, from that, I am a little bit more positive uh, than uh, my uh, two fellow speakers here, because first of all, the income inequality, so separate from the wealth inequality, the income inequality is, if you compare it in Europe, is rather low, and it has just barely increased in the last 10 years. Um, so that, that's, I think, is very good news. Um, but And also, the report of today says that uh, we have actually managed to keep the um, unequal spreading of the benefits of globalization rather limited. So basically, uh, our redistribution policies have been working very well in making the uh, unequal outcomes of globalization less severe. That said, I actually have interviewed a European economist from Italy uh, when I was a journalist a few months ago still. Um, and he said that what is called the China shock, so the, the, uh, in, uh, as soon as China started exporting uh, cheap manufacturer-made products to uh, the European mainland, there are areas in the Netherlands which have suffered extraordinarily. For example, the north of Brabant has been really uh, severely hit by that, and you see in exact those regions, you see the populist vote arising. So um, it's not that there's nothing unequal and nothing happening in Holland. And there is, I mean, there's a huge unequal story if you look at wealth. Mm -hmm. But that's such a complicated story yeah, because it's mm -hmm. also connected to the uh, wealth that is locked into the uh, housing market. Yeah. And our wealth is quite equally spread through the pension system. So, but to summarize it up, we are less hit 
also because we have a government working very hard and everybody who's paying the taxes, you pay it for something because it's redistributed yes. to the people. Yes, and maybe one more remark. So, so you see in the Netherlands that the gross inequality has increased massively, and even uh, to the same extent as in the USA. Uh, but the net inequality, income inequality, has not increased. But um, I think that if you really think about this gross inequality compared to the net inequality and the difference that, uh, that has become so large, that actually raises the question of solidarity. So basically, the demand on, solidarity, on income solidarity that we are asking from Dutch citizens is much higher than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is starting to break, yes. and that's dangerous. Yes. So having said that, so uh, there is stress on the Dutch solidarity among the Dutch, but perhaps people now think, uh, what, 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 what was it? We were talking about the future of the Eurozone, not about uh, inequality. Um, so normally when you talk about the future of the Eurozone, you talk a lot about, but, uh, a lot about uh, debt and deficits and, and the, the democratic deficit of the Eurozone. But how do we link then inequality, populism, and stress on the Eurozone? Because probably it's connected. If there's already stress on the solidarity within a country, then it's really do difficult to have solidarity with another country, or not? It is. Um, before I answer, I think there is a driver for a few slides uh, there. Oh, yes. Can, can I help? Uh, can I help you with that? Yeah. Um, this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So um, I'll be super, super fast. Let me tell you what I've done. Um, I've done um, some behavioral uh, tests with kids, uh, teenagers and preschool kids. So uh, what I wanted to show is exactly how. Yeah, you have to go back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well. What? Yeah, yes. there it is. Okay. How inequality uh, affects the politics and affects so the eurozone. Uh, well, I have taken uh, kids from uh, different social classes. In, in here, these are teenagers, 16, 17 years old. Uh, the, the left side of the distribution are poorer. The, the right side are uh, rich kids. And uh, what you see is fidati degli altri, is trust the other people, and give a mark to this. So essentially, the poor kids don't trust the other people. And but since I don't want, ah. Can we go on, further down? Yeah, I think you have to point there. Here it is. OK, OK, they have a very low self-esteem. Just uh, like 15% of them think, think they are smarter than average. But what I want to show you is that there are antisocial ideas about how they should behave in societies. If they think the social elevator is stuck for them, and this is why inequality is a problem, they think to believe that behaving antisocially is good or it's not that bad. Uh, help the, the next person. And you see, uh, essentially, the poor kids uh, give, of course, uh, this is, you, you give a high mark, uh, one to ten, you give anyway a high mark, but the, the poor kids, the, the three lower columns, they give, they give a lower mark than the rich kids, but this is not so much. Can, can we move it on by one? Mm, click over there, perhaps. No. Uh, you, ch you have to you put your hand there. There? Yeah, yes. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong advice. Yeah. So what is, yeah. uh, help me a little bit, because what is Aspen, Gislieri, Parini, Padab? Uh, okay, uh, these are different schools. Uh, okay, essentially, those are the schools. Uh, uh, the, the, the schools higher up are essentially kids from 80% of the parents are, are, have at least a tertiary degree or more. The, the schools uh, in the lower part of this distribution essentially 7% or 13% of the parents have a tertiary degree. And this is, don't get too much tired, don't work too hard at school or at work, give a mark to that, and they, the poor kid don't believe in making an effort. I go on. Uh, mistreat the people who mistreat you, so make your justice by yourself. Yes. There, is, there is no impersonal justice, no institutions to protect you. 
and they give a higher mark. Yeah. So essentially, when you think there is inequality and you don't stand a chance, you misbehave. You think the idea of misbehaving is not that bad, but think about a society, sorry, in the Italian case, but many European countries, the distribution, the, the ones in the lower part is the majority. And the kid, those upper class kids is a small minority. So people start misbehaving. This is the root of populism. And well, my, my metaphor is not that poetic, but it's double parking. Double parking solves the problem of looking for a parking lot, parking space, except it creates a huge traffic jams behind you. And why you, you double park? Because you don't think you will get a fine. So you don't believe institutions will enforce the common rules. But, but so I'm weak sorry, institution but is also a basis. Well, I, I mean, I, I mean, they're really nice questions and, uh, and uh, the result's striking. But I don't think you can kind of causally relate this to inequality at all. I mean, you, you don't, you basically, uh, what you don't know is like just hypothetical. You could see that, I mean, uh, let's say in schools with uh, kids from poor backgrounds, um, uh, so, so their attitudes might be, I don't know, a, a way of surviving in their cultural environment, let's say that. And maybe that is kind of uh, by coincidence linked to uh, the um, sub uh, persistence of um, low economic growth uh, in, these, in, the inter, in the intergenerational uh, economic uh, uh, income growth. So you don't, so basically, whether it is the inequality that is, that is causing these uh, variation in the, in the social answers of these kids, I think that is a little bit, is going a little bit too but, far but to say. Yes, I, I, although it's an interesting remark, I don't know we, if we really have to go in depth about okay. inequality, because we, I, I really, we are here for the future of the Eurozone. So although we have Branco here, I know it's very tentative to, to uh, yeah. but it's more like, um, we never, what, what strikes me is that it's, it's a big issue. I think that is outlined. But it's actually uh, a seed for populism. But we don't talk about it in that way. We are talking about Brussels being very bureaucratic. We are talking about um, Brussels want to take over everything. We talk about sovereignty. We talk about an identity crisis. That's what you hear all the time. But Perhaps there's something more underneath. But can we just follow up on, on what Sandra said? I will be very brief, I promise. Uh, I think it's really very important because that was my point, which maybe I didn't sort of put very explicitly. But the underlying forces of the rising inequality, driven by, as I was saying before, by large, by large share of capital income, by technological change, and by globalization, are really in all the Western countries more or less the same. You know, you have an upward trend to inequality, as, as Sandra said, gross inequality before government redistribution. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep this at the level where it was, you need to create a bigger and bigger wedge, because this is your yes. net inequality, and this is your gross. Yeah, the government has to work harder. That, well, the government has to redistribute yes. more, to impose higher taxes, uh, to mm -hmm. impose more progressivity. It becomes harder and harder. You cannot uh, impose today's taxes that you were exposing in the 1960s. There is simply uh, the, the, uh, the, the willingness to do that, as Sandra and you were saying, is going to be less and less. Impose on that the issue of migration and impose on top of that the issue of a redistribution within the European Union, and then you very clearly see the limits of the redistribution. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, in that sense, uh, inequality and redistribution really directly go into the issue of sustainability of, of the European Union, of the common policy towards migration, and so on, simply because I think that the, there are limits to the amount of redistribution that can be done. And, and is that how you explain Brexit as well? That's why they voted, 52% voted, OK, we'll, we'll get out. At least we don't have to. Uh, fund the European Union anymore? Yeah, 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 yeah I'm not uh, explaining Brexit. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no to me, Brexit uh, 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 is a clear chain of events. Uh, 2004, uh, accession of, of uh, the ten central, first eight uh, Central uh, and Eastern European countries, and uh, all countries waived uh, freedom of movement in a transitional phase, except three. 
the only large country that waived it was uh, Tony Blair's Britain, because this optimism about globalization, the markets will fix everything, will find its balance. So essentially, the others were Sweden and Ireland. Essentially, everybody went to the UK, because the income difference was such that there is no reason not to go, since there is no friction, and beautiful Ryanair flights, and so on and so forth. Everybody went there, except uh, financial crisis came along, the crash, they spent so much money bailing out the banks, they came out of the crisis with 100% debt to GDP and 10% and, uh, uh, deficit to GDP. And Cameron uh, won the election with this idea of big society, in other words, uh, cut the welfare state. They cut on the schools, they cut on, on the public health, and suddenly you, have, you can go online and, and look uh, for the primary schools in, in Britain. In, in the peripheries, you have those classes with 50 kids of whom 50% uh, are not mother language, and so they, the locals are so angry because they, they feel their kids have, are held back by the foreigners, by the Polish, when in fact they are held back by uh, the cuts in welfare spending for that school, or, or the waiting lists for the hospitals. So that chain of events focused the anger of the locals on the Polish at the corner of the street, or maybe not even uh, people from the EU, but anyway, the idea, we get out of the EU, we get out of this problem, but there were big policy mistakes, 2004, 2010, by the British government. And maybe just one very cynical remark to just add to that is that um, it was actually the British who were always pushing within Europe to expand Europe on the eastern side to include Poland, and they did that because they wanted to water down the ability of Europe to take action on any policy measure. They wanted to just keep Europe something very slow progressing. And so they were always pushing for this expansion into Eastern Europe. And when the expansion happened and the Polish immigrants came to work in the UK, that was the reason why they wanted to leave Europe, but they were actually the ones who got them in. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, but, but to me the Brexit is, is very much about what happens if people are not well educated because the uh, uh, education inequality in the UK is huge. There are private schools where people are extremely well educated and there are in the countrysides, there are public schools. I went uh, to some universities once in the north of, of the UK. You really don't know what you see. We, we would never see something like that in the Netherlands. It really kind of, so you, you smell see? poverty, basically. The, 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 um, the curtains, the, the window, everything looks like it hasn't been touched in 100 years. Mm -hmm. And um, this kind of uh, inequality of opportunities, as uh, Branko also mentioned, is crucially important for what happened with Brexit because the uh, inequality in education led to um, politicians taking power that could just lie to the people because they have been lying about Brexit in a really outrageous manner. For example, there is this small village in the UK where actually 80% of the uh, spending on education and uh, the health system came from the European Union. And politicians have always denied this and always said it was UK spending and that the, that the EU was just costing them money. And they found out what happened and now that these subsidies are drying up. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, now, as again, the polls in the UK all say that uh, the British people don't want to uh, Brexit anymore. So that's also a lesson from populism. The idea that you have to listen to the will of the people, that only holds if you have been uh, investing in educating those people to be good listeners. Yes, and investing in reducing inequality as, as well, because what you were saying, when you talk about the future of the, of the Eurozone, we talk a lot about yeah, restructuring the, the Eurozone, how do we make decisions together, but you were saying um, in, uh, in your introduction, like the European Union also has to give more room um, for the inequality within countries. Like Italy has north-south, I think every country has like poorer parts and richer parts. And if you don't focus on that, then you will lose Europe along the way. 
Wang Hui. Is that a question to me? Yeah. Okay, thank you, because that allows me to uh, pick up from where... Oh, uh, oh, oh to, 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 to not answer my question, but okay. just respond no, 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 to... No, no, okay. no. Should I just leave <laughs> no, 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 otherwise, no, no. so you can respond uh, can to each other remarks? I can, I can answer uh, uh, precisely uh, by Great. picking up that argument. So uh, one test I have done in preschools, so nurseries, kids uh, five years old, I was talking about that before, uh, in a, a Naples school in a very rough neighborhood, and then in a private school in Milan, where one academic year costs 16,000 euros. So that already selects the kind of families and kids. So what I've done, uh, the, 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 the test works like that, with a Pokemon for the uh, boys and frozen cards for the girls that are not interested in Pokemon, at least in Italy. I don't know about Netherlands, but... That's global, so, I think. OK, yeah. it's global. Um, so it works like that. I sit in a classroom with a uh, teacher, and the kids come one by one. And they come and they say, ah, look, uh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm in Naples. I'm saying, ah, you know, the, there is this kid in Milan, uh, Giovanni, who uh, asked me to give you 10 Pokemon cards. Are you interested? And of course, the kid's very interested. So I, I give the 10 cards. And then when the kid's are very happy with the 10 cards, say, ah, but there is a problem because Giovanni now does not have uh, cards anymore. He cannot play anymore. So he's asking me to tell you if... Uh, you can give them, uh, give him back five cards tomorrow to thank you. He will give you ten. But if you don't want, you go home with your ten cards. So the choice is whether I trust uh, in personal, this guy who I don't know and the other person who never seen in order to make a self-interested investment and get 50% more tomorrow, or I don't trust. Uh, and essentially, the difference is that if, if I don't trust, essentially, I fail the test. I don't, I, I'm not able to exert trust. And you see the upper class kids failed 25% of them. The lower class kids failed nearly 50% of them. So why uh, am I talking about this? Uh, because these are kids five years old. Already, trust is badly affected, depending on how you're growing up and your environment. Actually, I've divided, divided the Naples uh, kids into kids from mafia-related families and kids from honest families, and there is no difference. So the environment determines the, the level of trust. Why uh, do I think it, this is relevant for populism and for Europe? Because sure enough, those kids don't have trust, and how uh, will they express their lack of trust when they will be able to vote, when they will be able to listen to politicians' argument? They will hate Brussels. If in uh, 20 years' time it will still be fashionable to say too much Brussels bureaucracy, they will express their lack of trust by supporting the populace. And think about their parents, how they react so it's, uh, and that's, that is the link mm -hmm. between uh, kind of anti-social behavior, lack of, social, lack of mm -hmm. opportunity. It's the lack of trust. It is the lack of trust that, is a that has a clear social marker yes. in a place where you don't see opportunity. It's not so much the inequality, but the inequality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think this is the problem. Anybody has a question about this? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, so this is all about the internal aspect of uh, Europe and the European Union. Can you maybe comment on how Europe relates to the other big powers in the world at the moment, so uh, China and America, and how yeah, this will develop and what the influence will be on Europe's position? Can I say something not on uh, politics, but uh, one thing that actually I forgot to mention when I was talking about Africa. Uh, you will see the connection now. I think that one uh, totally unexplored part is whether China, with its inroads and investments in Africa, would actually help Africa growing. And if it does, uh, if Africa were to become, when I speak of Africa, obviously there are 55 countries, but if sufficient number of countries were to start really growing at the rates that we never believed that Asia would be able to grow. You, some people who are older remember that uh, Myrdal wrote a book which is called The Asian Drama, where he actually argued he was one of the preeminent economists in the world and argued that Asia would never develop because of high population growth and so on. And then, of course, things worked out luckily differently. 
So if, uh, if Africa starts growing, and if it is really a sort of pushed on that growth trajectory by Chinese investment or Chinese involvement, uh, China will become the best friend of the European Union, because in principle that should actually uh, make uh, Africans less keen to migrate. I know that there is a talk of, I mean, when you're very, very poor, then you cannot even move. Then when you become richer, you move more. But if you go over that hump, then uh, you would actually probably migrate less. So I think it's an interesting intercontinental uh, or whatever general aspect that was not, um, uh, it was not mentioned. Why, why are we not investing in Africa like China does? We have more interests there. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a question for the European <laughs> Union, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe uh, also relating to your question, I think it's very interesting. Like, like a typically economist answer to the question of a rising trade war between China and the USA would be that that kind of uh, deteriorates uh, everybody's economic prospects uh, on average. Uh, however, that said, I do think that we can think of some arguments why the Netherlands, as a strongly export-oriented country, might, uh, uh, in a competitive sense, benefit uh, from a distort, a distorted trade relation between the US and China. Given that that is taking place and there is a new state of the world where, let's say, trade is kind of ants running around in a, in a big heap, and then the, the distorted trade relation is like a big stone that has been thrown onto this, onto this heap, right? So, so these ants, they will find a new way of getting uh, their uh, elements from A to B. And I think the Netherlands would, could be, for example, in steel, could be well positioned to, uh, to, to take some of these um, failed relations between the US and China over. Of course, uh, our own steel producing, Tata Steel, will be less happy about it, but um, there are so many uh, steel consuming uh, individuals uh, in a country that benefit uh, in total more than that one big company loses out on uh, comp extra competition. So I think, so in the sense that, um, let's say, given that, that on average the world will be worse off if there's uh, less free trade, I'm convinced of that, um, given that that happens, we can relatively benefit from it. One, one uh, question that we, as Europeans we should ask ourselves is why we did not develop any uh, new big uh, tech company? Uh, the, the big uh, companies, the ones that are capitalized at least 400, 500 billion dollars are either US or Chinese companies. So we don't have all, all those data, so artificial intelligence will advance more slowly because artificial intelligence needs data to advance. Why have we not managed to develop a company of that size? I don't have the answer. I think it's a problem. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll just give it my... You are talking about China, the United States, and then Europe. Europe is not a country. Europe is a, a combination of totally different countries which do not want and do not wish to be together. The Europe, the idea of European project is based on get together, avoid the, the war again. We don't want to have any war anymore. And uh, it is a social project. European Union is not only about economics. It's a social project. It's financial project and also social project. Mm -hmm. And it is not a country. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes it totally a different uh, game comparing to United States of America. Because if you're talking about America, you're not talking about the American continent. You're talking about United States of America mm -hmm. and China. And these are totally two different countries, and we are not talking even about Russia because it's lost country. Uh, so, but I'm, uh, but I'm surprisingly, I'm seeing, I'm listening. It's it's not being talked about the cultural aspects of European Union, which is completely diverse comparing to other two country, big countries which you are comparing to. From which country are you? 
I'm from, uh, I'm living in the Netherlands. I have worked many time, many years for, you, for uh, the Dutch government. And uh, the couple of last year, uh, specialized in European Union. So I'm a little bit familiar with how European Union works. And I also understand the dissatisfaction of people of European Union. Okay, valid point, yes. yes. I think it's really an essential point because the, um, like the, 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 the European project was an economic project uh, to prevent war. There was n n people were never asked whether they wanted to converge in a social manner because that would actually mean converging and uh, being uh, willing to be uh, solidar uh, have solidarity with each other and that is just simply absent. Yes. That's what you see happening now. Because the economic convergence, in, this, in a sense, requires political convergence, and that actually kind of gets stuck on the fact that we don't want to converge in a cultural manner. Mm -hmm. so yes. no, sorry, sorry, I don't... Th this is getting difficult, because then you will have a one-on-one. -on -one. So if you would please allow me to give you a microphone, you can give a yeah. remark. And at the bar, then you can have a discussion, okay? <laughs> No, it's, 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 I, I just don't want to interrupt anymore. No, no, that's okay, but it's more like that I will get a microphone so everybody can hear what you are saying because it's very interesting what you are saying. Thank you. Um, it's, it's just like average European person thinks a bunch of higher educated people in Brussels, they decide about me, how I have to live my life and I don't want it anymore. Mm. And just because of the growth of uh, uh, welfare in European Union, the, the questions are bigger now. The, the, there are more people who are getting involved in this kind of things because of internet, because of the communication. So there are more ordinary people who are asking the question, who are you to tell me how I, am, how I have to run my, my village? It's not about the big cities, it's about the small villages. Right. European Union is everywhere and people don't see it. They see Mussolini there, they see Hitler there, they see people who are ordering them to do things and they don't like it. It is very simple. It is uh, European Union, dissatisfaction in European Union is not about the money, it's not about economics, it's about the culture. European Union is not a country. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, that was, yeah. But that's actually a repetition what you said. This yes. Thing. Okay, yeah, no, but just to, to summarize but it, that, it, yeah, that, that's it, not... I mean, the, the relation, I think what's very interesting in, in the way it relates to what uh, Branko said in the beginning, is that it's actually, uh, so Europe is such a wealthy um, continent, uh, and usually you would expect populism to rise in, in, the, right. in the areas where there's less wealth, but... Um, so my idea about this is that maybe the more wealth you have, the more, the higher the, the version of losing that wealth. Um, and, and, and actually, another thing that you said that I found also very interesting is that this inequality in Europe, which might be the basis of populism, um, to what extent, I don't know the answer, so it's the question actually. So to what extent um, is that related to inequality difference between young and old people. Because there is, in this whole wealthy continent, there is one group that is actually uh, suffering from high unemployment, high job insecurity, yeah, young no people. old age welfare, yeah. uh, uh, uncer very uh, much uncertainty on old age uh, welfare, uh, their situation, and that is young people. And uh, I'm wondering whether it's also those young people that votes, voted, are voting for the populist parties. Because they are the ones who are actually... I think the statistics show actually they're, they're voting against the mainstream parties. The young. They are voting, voting. They are voting against the mainstream parties. I mean, so they, I, I'm not a huge fan of the term populism. <laughs> so actually, but they do vote against the established parties. Let's right. put it like that. So it is. Uh, on, on, on inequality, of course, I think I will not go into cultural aspects because I find it hard to quantify and then it goes all over the place. But uh, uh, I think when it comes to inequality, it is very clear that if EU has stayed with EU 6 or EU 15, uh, it would be a more equal place. 
there is it's a kind of obvious because inequality in the European Union comes largely from the enlargement because it is really the enlargement that introduced large differences in income levels and that introduced the, the fact that Europe now, if you take EU28, has an equality level which is about the same as the US level. But the difference is the following. In Europe, if you want to go after, I mean, to reduce that inequality level, you have to transfer either money to the poorer countries or make sure that the poorer countries grow faster. In the US, the differences between the states have gone down over the last 50 years. So they are poor and rich individuals, but they are not all located in, you know, distinct states. Hmm. So the, the problem is easier there, I believe, to be solved because you have poor people. One could be in Arkansas, another could be in Massachusetts. But here, when you have to poor, help poor people, if you want, co co I mean, what is it called, uh, the cohesion, then you have to people in Bulgaria and Romania and not people in, uh, in the Netherlands. But that's probably not very popular in the north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I just wanted to, um, to say something. Uh, when um, you were talking, uh, I remember the um, uh, famous uh, phrase, I don't remember who said that, when Italy was unified in 1861, and someone said, now we have made Italy, we need to make Italians. So uh, c culture, culture is not something that <laughs> given uh, once and for all. Why am I saying that? Because when we talk about culture, inequality, and the European Union, there is something that uh, uh, keeps a glue that keeps all this together, and uh, I would call it zero attrition. Today, moving from one country to the other is zero is a zero attrition game. Think about you you do a job interview on Skype, uh, you move to another country on Ryanair and, and sleep on a couch or on Airbnb. By the way, none of those are. European companies, uh, um, and and uh, and even if you don't find a job, you can easily integrate in other countries' uh, economy, doing delivery, doing this kind of uh, gig uh, uh, jobs, which means that we have seen a very important amount of in intra-EU mobility. I give you uh, one figure. I think as we speak, about uh, 20 million. Uh, Europeans live in a different EU country. And they move and they move and they agglomerate into the most successful countries and they leave the uh, less successful countries or the countries with uh, uh, lower income per capita. Especially when you have these uh, 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 huge per capita differences. I think Germany to Bulgaria is a factor of our uh, more than one to five, and different economic institutions, because in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, you work uh, on, on the factory floor at the minimum wage that is set by law, under 500 euros, and you don't have wage bargaining, uh, you move. But that was exactly the intention, right, of the European yeah, project? It is. It is. Uh, it is. So, so it, it is creating a culture. It, it, on, the, on the one hand, a European culture, talk to those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was an economic migrant, as an unemployed, young unemployed. And, and now the new generation, there are many more. So this is one thing. It, it, it has positive and negative uh, side effects, because the people who, who are left behind are mm -hmm. much more culturally homogeneous and less dynamic and probably more bound mm -hmm. to vote for populist uh, parties. Think Hungary, think Romania. The people who are left behind, they don't okay. want to move west. I, I but, want to leave the analysis. I would, I would like to talk about solutions also because of, of, of yes, the time. Can uh, I say one thing? Because it is a solution, actually. So, he, so then you, if it's a solution, yes, you can I say something. I think it fits yeah. the frame. But um, because, you know, the, the, um, when we come to the core of the, of the Eurozone and, and the functioning of it and, and the, like the, the, the eye of the storm Italy at the moment, wasn't it the case from the beginning of the European project that we knew that if you get the Euro, then countries which are performing badly in an economic sense, they cannot devaluate their currency anymore and everything is fine. So Italy cannot, if they would have the lira, it would just devaluate the whole thing. But that's not possible because it's in the euro. And then one other way to get some air into this tension 
is uh, labor mobility, right? Because if labor supply is reduced, if people move out of Italy and go work in Germany, that would actually um, bring a new equilibrium in Italy to improve the economic situation. Unless it's a brain drain, then you are yeah. perhaps worse well, off. Uh, I, I think yeah. uh, uh, devaluation is overrated. I don't think uh, uh, Italy needs devaluation at all. Uh, honestly, uh, exports are growing 8% year on year, which is faster than Germany at this point. It's not a problem of external competitiveness. And you look at the numbers, uh, I, we were talking uh, about that before, but uh, 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 Italian exports outside the EU are now larger than French exports outside the EU without a devaluation. The problem is how open a society is to new entrants, to the young. So it's a, a matter of opening up that mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of devaluing. And this is where, unfortunately, the EU comes short. We obsess about deficit and debt, which is very important, but it's only part of the story. And why do we obsess about that? Because we are concerned about transfers, fiscal transfers. We don't think enough about giving more powers to Brussels on structural reforms, on how, sorry, this is a bad bureaucrat, but how the workings of an economy should look like. And this is what makes the difference. It's very good that Italians go to Germany, provided that there is a space for young Italians and others to integrate into Italy. Either they will come back bringing new knowledge or Swedish uh, guys will come to Italy. But this but is the, what yeah. is lacking. Yeah. But, this but is the northern exactly countries will say like, okay, but you haven't uh, transformed your own country for the last 20 years, so why should we come up and pay the bill now? Yeah, that's of course the, the solidarity issue look, that is. Uh, look, is, is, nobody, is uh, Italy does not need outsiders money and nor is it requesting outsiders money. My point is, and I don't think there is an overall problem of competitiveness, it's a problem of a closed society that has not opened up enough mm -hmm. and has, you know, creating these problems. And these people are anti-Europeans, not because they are ideologically anti-Europeans, but because Europe represents checks and balances of a liberal society, a liberal democracy. They don't like Europe because they will have to share power with Europe. And they don't like the president because they will have to share power with the but president. There is a this paradox is the in there, I think, because you know the, the obsession of uh, Europe with debt is actually an obsession of Europe of, over debt, given that there's no structural growth. And Italy has not known much structural growth in the last uh, decade. So, um, so I think that's the obsession. And so, Given that you always hear from, I lived in Italy for a while, and we talked about it before, and what well, you always hear that in their hearts, Italians, this actually, they trust European governments more than they trust Italian governments. And they always say they want things to be less uh, like um, corporatistic uh, or a little bit corrupt in the South. So, so they say they want these reforms, but um, when they don't want to accept sovereignty from Brussels to impose these reforms, and they know that Rome is not going to do it. So why? Okay. Uh, I think um, the League, that uh, is a key actor here, had a big rhetoric against Rome at some point in 1996 or something it reached the point that uh, the League uh, threatened secession if the South didn't make it to reach the Euro. Uh, then uh, uh, Salvini, the current uh, League leader, realized that he had to turn all the, the heat from Rome to Brussels because that worked well in France with Marine Le Pen. So he changed strategies and unfortunately he found enough of those kids to believe him. So and now uh, the, the brainwashing has been about Brussels. I'm very happy that now he owns the place because he will have to show what he can do and I hope the fever will pass. Um, I'm very sure, I'm, I can give you a few numbers. Uh, I don't think Italy is a case of fiscal indiscipline. If you take 
uh, the budget balance before paying interest that is not controlled by the government last 25 years, 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, Italy will be with the highest surplus before paying interest, so the primary surplus in Europe with Belgium, and actually above Germany. Except that that has not come down. Why has it not come down? Because there is no, in, not enough economic growth. And why there isn't enough economic growth? Because stupid centralized wage bargaining Yes. And, and that there was a reason that is a vested interest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, then I stopped talking about Italy because it's boring. And the reason is because trade unions and also uh, uh, employers' representatives did not want local or company level bargaining because they were concerned about delocalization from north to south to prevent that kind of delocalization, which is very mm -hmm. stupid because companies will go to Slovakia anyway today. Mm -hmm. But that remained. So to me, uh, this is a case where elites failed their country. And uh, we, we are at a point where we need to have this kind of political crisis. We, have, we need to go through this political crisis. And I'm confident that we, we can come up on top of it. Mm -hmm. But this is not a financial crisis. And to an extent, this is not a competitiveness crisis. It is an economic crisis because this economy cannot integrate enough of its skills. Okay. Thank you. To, to round up, um, Branko, I, I have the last question, question for you because there are actually two things mentioned. Um, why populism is rising and why the European Union is under pressure. One was the, the rising inequality. Uh, but you also talk, talked about Europe's curse of wealth and that is the attraction of migrants. And you said very clearly that will stay for the next 100 years. So we'll, we'll have to deal with that. And you, you spoke very fast and you said a lot of things, but I, I would like to, if you could please elaborate on that, because you said that you should have different sorts of citizenships. Okay, what I, do you mean? Yeah, and I, I, and, and I, I know that it has to be in a few minutes because yes, have, people need yeah. a drink, but it's... I think you said something very heavy and very political and very... Mm, I know. Uh, you, you can have a lot of debate about that when you are having your drinks in five Yes, minutes. okay, so let me tell you that. Yeah, you definitely can have lots of debate. I will, I will try to really to be very brief. Uh, I start from a position, my preferred position would be as an economist, as sort of cosmopolitan, to say, okay, labor and capital are two factors of production. There is no reason why we should not have full mobility of labor if you have full mobility of capital. And I think it's a, it's a very defensible proposition in very general terms. Now, then I have to face the fact that mobility of labor is not exactly the same as mobility of capital because it leads to the effect that actually people are not avatars, they are actually real individuals, they bring different culture, norms, and so on. So then the fear is the following. If that's the case, and we have seen indications in Europe, quite a few actually, you talked about uh, Italy, we talked about the Netherlands and uh, the right-wing party saying, uh, you know, the Netherlands are full like a hotel. There are no more rooms, so don't come here. Uh, then the danger is the following, is that actually if we do nothing, we would move towards a situ situation which I think is suboptimal for the world and even for the participants of actually having zero migration where there would be uh, no migrants coming in. Europe needs more people, but, not, but it would lock itself out. Uh, migrants will not be able to, you know, able to improve their position. So basically, there will be no reduction in global inequality, no reduction in global uh, poverty, and so on. So then I say, OK, fine, if, we, if this is not good, so what can we do? And my idea is simply to, to ask the following question. You know, Federico was asking kids this question, what would you do with 10 Pokemon cards? I asked people the following question. I said, let me give you the situation. If, you, if I were to give less rights to, to foreign workers, to ask them to return to their own country after four years, to implement that, and to give them no civic rights, but only the rights which derive from war, would you be willing to accept a little bit more of them? And then I think actually basically you establish a negative relationship. In that sense, the, the less rights they have, the more is the local population willing to accept them. 
and then you choose a position on that curve where you believe is the best for your own country mm -hmm. where the population is. Mm -hmm. But that means that you de facto discriminate against people who come here. You never give them the right to the Dutch citizenship. You implement a, a compulsory return. Their visas are strictly work-related. Uh, I know that people would tell me, well, that was the German idea with Gasterbeiter, but it didn't work out. But it didn't work out because there was no compulsory implementation. People stayed in Germany. Here you would have a circular migration. And the final thing, I think it needs, if an idea like this were to be negotiated, it needs to be negotiated between the European Union and the African Union or other countries, and it needs to have bilateral quotas. Mm -hmm. So they, these are the unpopular ideas, but I wanted to say the background that I'm not just some bad guy, I'm actually an immigrant myself, so I'm not some bad guy who would actually like to screw migrants. I'm actually saying that because I think that's the only way, it seems to me one of the ways, to overcome the reluctance of native population to accept immigration. Okay. Yeah, it is actually. That with temporary labor, with seasonal labor, it's exact, and it's actually Singaporean model as well. Yeah. I think this is a fantastic idea. Oh, oh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll, I'll, Singapore and, and, okay. and, and I will have one more question. Yeah. And I think Chandra uh, should wait for the question. Yeah. 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 But you didn't raise your hand. Can you make a question? Yeah, I can make a question. It, might, it, was, it was a question, in fact. Okay, yell it out because the micro doesn't work. What is the moral side of this? Exactly. So, I, I actually. I to see it. I know there's a really, I mean, the, the nice thing about this idea, because actually I, I knew it because I interviewed yeah, Bronco a, a year and a half ago. But um, so the, the nice thing about this is that from our high moral standing in Europe, people say we don't want dual citizenships because everybody, if you come to Europe and you're accepted, you're accepted as a full human being with all the citizenship rights. But that's f from the perspective of our high morals from the perspective of the morals of the people who are coming, uh, it's immoral to deny them this dual citizenship. And second, I think this, this is a great idea because of two very positive side effects that I see. One is that once immigrants are in Europe, the, the studies that I mentioned in the beginning, they show that once people interact with immigrants, they become less afraid of immigrants, so they will accept more of them for a full citizenship, that's one. And second, those immigrants are uh, mostly young people, which would very much alleviate our aging problem with all our pensioners. So, and that would also put a lot of pressure away from our whole social model and our social contract, which would in the end increase the willingness or the, yeah, the willingness to accept these migrants again further. So mm -hmm. I see it. I think it's very positive. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, now it's, it's now. <laughs> India is now getting involved. Okay. Are you still on? Can we have two more questions, answer, or actually, do you want to? Let me see. Yeah. The moral part. Yeah. Right. India. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like this evening? Did you oh, I enjoyed it. it. Yes. Um, okay. It seems like the discussion. It's not raining anymore. <laughs> oh, then I can leave after the beer. But um, it seems like the discussion went off. Europe is falling apart. Ninety percent of the discussion today was about migrants and refugees, and not about intra-European dynamics. And there seems to be a clear fault line, at least if you look at the media, with Northern Europe pretending to be the good, responsible types, and Southern Europe very elegantly called the pigs, and that betrays a kind of condescension of the north to the south. And this condescension comes mostly in terms of the financialization of the whole European Union project, right? And so you've got all this pressure put on certain countries because they didn't pay their bills. Uh, but most uh, economists who aren't from Europe, from the United States, for example, say there's a structural problem with the euro. Uh, in that Germany enjoyed a devaluation, and I know you think devaluation is not a good idea, but apparently the Chinese have been systematically manipulating their currency to get a competitive advantage for all these years, so they must have something right given that they're growing at 8% for the last 15 years. Um, 
And that seems to be one of the main issues in terms of the future of the Eurozone, because you can't have this thing you said about the United States. Well, it doesn't matter where you work in the US, you pay your taxes to the federal government in Washington, DC, and they distribute. Mm -hmm. But here, if you have an Italian working in Germany, he's been educated by the Italians, but he's paying tax in Germany, and the Germans don't want to send any of that money back. So why aren't we talking about this financialization of Europe? Yeah, the transfers. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Itself. I think you can take that one, right? I think I think we were lucky that it was raining because we got a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have really to change this narrative that Germany is paying for everybody else. This is, sorry, completely false. Um, and I'll give you some figures about who is paying what for whom. Uh, and here again, we were talking about this before. Germany is the first country in the West that started having a negative uh, natural balance, meaning more deaths than newborns, than, than, than new kids, in 1973. Uh, even as other uh, European countries still were booming in terms of baby boom. Uh, uh, the result of that is that if you take the natural balance of Germany uh, 2011, 2016, it is uh, negative in the aggregate by 1.5 million people. So net of any migration, Germany would have shrunk, what, nearly 2%. Uh, uh, imagine what, does, uh, what uh, that does to economic growth, uh, because uh, every person contributes, I guess, in Germany for 20,000, also in, on, only in consumption. The way Germany, in a way, could mitigate the problem, among other things, is by net migration from the rest of the EU. And the number of other European um, people who moved to Germany, the net numbers, is, uh, I'm going by Eurostat numbers, I've done this and published, I'm, I'm very sure about the numbers. It's 1.7 million uh, Europeans take out the Syrians and all, I mean, the refugees and all the rest, just the Europeans, 1.7 million Europeans coming to Germany, of whom two thirds from Central and Eastern Europe, one third from Southern Europe. Now, if you take the amount of investments that went into the education of that 1.7 million people, and I, I've taken uh, very arbitrarily 30% of tertiary degree, 30% of secondary degree, the rest we stopped studying at 14, basically. And you average that out by the cost of education, by the public money as published by the OECD, you know how much investment went into those people? Public sector, eh? it's 200 billion euros. That is the amount. And so when you are at the Bulgarian government, you say, ah, how do we grow uh, faster? Let's invest in education. Let's invest in the German economy. But this doesn't factor in at all in their narrative. The narrative is that uh, we are paying for everybody else, and since we are paying for everybody else, everybody else, they are pigs, and so on and so forth. So I think we as public speakers uh, have a responsibility. And sorry, uh, we are all from countries where we have very open debates with people taking different sides. There is one country where the public debate is very monolithic, and the, the country that I have just mentioned. Very few people there speak out. And if you ask the, the average German taxi driver or whatever, they think they are paying for Italy. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, and, but the reality is that if you take uh, the average Italian taxpayer, average even Spanish taxpayer or French taxpayer, they have paid as much into the bailouts as the average German taxpayer. But they weren't, they weren't told that. Yes, but I think, I mean, I agree with your analysis, but I don't think the solution is to blame each other back and forth, because even the German like taxi driver, is just trying to make sense of uh, a Europe that is too complex to grasp. And so basically you reduce all this complexity to something simple 
that you can understand. And that's what people in Italy and Spain and in Germany and the Netherlands do. So I think it's good to have this debate and to, but it's, I mean, I think the complexity is, is becoming a problem in itself. Mm -hmm. People can mm -hmm. just not Grasp get it, it anymore. Yeah, yeah but Dot, I think the responsibility... I'm just, I'm just, yeah. You know, I see that there are a few questions, but I also see that it's almost 10.30, and I just made an agreement also with the organization, you know, to stick to my timetable. So I'm, I'm sure that, that they will be here still. So I saw a few questions. You also had a question, but uh, that, that's, that's, that's fine. We haven't solved it, solved it, have we? Have we eh? It has become even more complex, and now e even complexity has become one of the arguments why everything is so complex. Um, um, but, but, but can I have a warm applause for the, for the panel, for Sandra Flippen, <laughs> for Branke Milosevic, and Federico Fabini. Um, and, and please, please join us to the bar. And um, India, thanks for, for having your input. Uh, and have a safe way home. And um, viva Europe! So yeah, because everybody jumps on you. So. Uh,